Welcome back, students. In all chemical reactions, there is an exchange or rearrangement of electrons. However, in electrochemistry, we are particularly interested in the electrons and focus on the exchange of electrons and describe how the exchange of electron affects atoms and ions. So today we'll start by discussing electrochemistry and we'll focus on an introduction to the elements of electrochemistry. Our learning goals for today are going to be to construct an overall reaction from the various half cell reactions we can find in tables and charts. Uh, we're going to want to be able to draw out a schematic of an electrochemical cell and understand why electrons flow from one side to the other. And then we'll calculate E0, which is the standard electrochemical uh, cell potential, and use that to calculate things like use for energy, uh, entropy, and equilibrium constant. We'll start by considering a zinc electrode placed into a zinc sulfate solution. We could write a balanced reaction for the dissociation of zinc metal. So the zinc metal in this electrode could dissociate into zinc plus two ions in the process losing two electrons. Um, the zinc ions would be soluble in the uh, aqueous solution and the electrons would remain with the zinc metal. Our intuition tells us that this process is going to be very unlikely to occur. We're not going to see dissolving of metals in water in this way. Uh, and this is, of course, true. So the equilibrium constant for this spontaneous dissociation of zinc metal into ions um, is on the order of 10 to the minus 14, so very unfavorable. Nevertheless, a very small amount of zinc would dissociate, and this would leave a buildup of electrons on the zinc metal uh, to the tune of about a one volt potential difference between the metal and the solution. We can't actually measure this electrical potential because we can only measure the potential difference between two identical phases. So we can measure the potential difference between, say, two metals, like maybe zinc and copper, um, but not between a metal and a solution. We can determine it, however, from the half cell reaction, as will be described shortly. We have a little bit of a challenge when we talk about electrochemistry, and that is the units are very strange. So most of us are not electricians or interested in electrical physics, and so we don't spend a lot of time thinking about all of these uh, electrical units, and even if we talk about magnetism, the magnetism units. Now, we spend our time talking about things like you know, seconds and newtons and pascals and joules, but if in the field of electrochemistry we have a whole bunch of different things like coulombs, volts, and ohms for resistance and Siemens for uh, conductance. Um, so our primary interest in describing electrochemistry is going to be in things that have the terms of volts, so that's the difference between electrochemical potential, um, and then also coulombs, which is the fundamental charge, uh, unit of charge. Um, so the, electric, uh, the charge of the electron is in coulombs, and differences between uh, different electrical potentials are in volts, and those are the most common ones we're going to see. Uh, measuring the conductance is also of import as well, and um, this is something that you might have to do in research in the future, but looking at the conductivity of solutions, this is often a way that we can measure, you know, flow through and so forth in different um, HPLC experiments. You can tell when your buffer is starting to flow through because the conductivity changes, so this is something that, that does come up in research. What we're going to do now is try to seek to describe how a difference in voltage or electrical potential will affect uh, charged particles. As you likely expect, neutral atoms are not going to be very much affected by an electrical potential, whereas ionic species that are charged will be very much affected by these difference in electrical potential. We'll start by describing the work it takes to move a charge through different electrical potentials. And so in this case, we have the derivative of the reversible work. And remember, we use this funny D because our work is not a state function. But the infinitesimal change in work is equal to the difference between the two electrical potentials, if we have electrical potential one and two. Uh, and then we multiply that by DQ, which is the charge that we are changing. Now, we can represent the charge that we are changing if we're thinking about saying something like electrons as the following. It's going to be negative, so we'll have negative V2 minus V1. And then the charge is equal to Z, F, 
dn, where z is the charge uh, in terms of the units of electron charge. So an electron would have a z of minus one, a sodium plus ion would be plus one, you know, an oxygen two minus would be minus two, and so forth. Um, and f is Faraday's constant, and Faraday's constant is simply the fundamental charge of an electron uh, times Avogadro's number. Um, so it's a molar charge for electrons, which is a pretty big number. It's about uh, 96,500 coulombs per mole. Uh, and then dn is the number of moles of electrons or other charged substances moved. So we can represent the work in this way. Since this electrical work is an example of non-expansion work, we can equate it with the Gibbs free energy. The work here is equal to the Gibbs free energy because it's reversible, and the Gibbs free energy is equal to the chemical potential at region two times the change of the number of molecules minus the chemical potential in region one times the change in number of molecules. And they're, they're different because we're flowing from one to the other, so the sign of dn is going to change. Here we have a little bit different of a chemical potential, and we have a mu with this tilde over it. This is the electrochemical potential rather than just the chemical potential. The electrochemical potential is equal to the regular chemical potential that we've been working with, and then we have to add a factor that talks about how the electrical potential affects it, and that factor is uh, this charge here, so it's, it's Z times phi, which is the, the potential, the electrical potential, and then times Faraday's constant. If we want to know how a particle of charge Z interacts with two identical phases differing only in electrical potential, we can take the difference between the two electrochemical potentials. And the only difference between these is the electrical potential in their regions. And so this would simply be equal to the standard potential plus Z phi two F, and then minus the chemical potential plus Z phi one F. And so putting these things together, we can get this is Z times phi two minus phi one times Faraday's constant. And as we'll see, if this isn't uh, already obvious to you, just like for dissolving ions, we can't actually ever measure just one strict uh, of voltage, one electrical potential. We have to measure it in relation to something else. So it's easier if we set this guy equal to zero, and then rather than having uh, two different regions that we really can't calculate for, we just simply calculate the difference. Um, so Z phi F here. If we rearrange this by adding the electrochemical potential at state one to the other side, we can see pretty easily that these two electrochemical potentials differing in the voltage are different. So the electrochemical at part two is greater than the electrochemical potential at point one. What does that mean? Well, it means that there's two different electrochemical potentials. And remember, this is related to the Gibbs free energy. So our particles will move to get to the lowest energy. Since the field of electricity was done based on positive charges, the convention is backwards here for electrical potentials compared to all of our other potential energies. Um, so positive charges move from a high electrical potential to a low electrical potential, where negative charges, like electrons, move from low to high electrical potential. Uh, so it's a little bit backwards. We want things to flow to low energy. And having a negative charge move to a high potential is flowing to a low energy, but it's kind of, it's a little bit backwards from the way we like to think about it. Uh, so what this means is that an electron would be expected to move from a chemical uh, with a low electrical potential, such as zinc, to one with a higher potential, such as copper. And this is in fact true. Electrons spontaneously move from zinc to copper if they're connected. Uh, at equilibrium, we say a little bit differently. We say that the Gibbs free energy at equilibrium is equal to the sum now of the stoichiometric coefficients times the electrochemical potential instead of the regular chemical potential. And this is actually what equals zero. So for these electrochemical processes, we have to include the potential differences um, and use the electrochemical potential. What might not be obvious to you is that these reactions are highly reversible. So if we consider this equation up here, what happens if we apply a very large negative uh, external voltage? Well, in this case, um, Z phi F will end up being negative. Um, and 
it doesn't really matter what this mu is. If once ZFF gets very, very negative, that can overwhelm the normal chemical potential and actually reverse the direction of the reaction. Um, so this is actually what goes on every time we recharge one of our electronic devices. We have batteries that flow spontaneously to discharge, and then when we plug them back into an outlet, we apply a very large external voltage, which actually reverses the chemical reaction and drives the battery back to being fully charged so it can discharge again. How can we tell which directions electrons will flow? We can't measure the potential of any one substance, but if we combine two together, we can get a difference in electrical potential between the two. It's convenient then to define a zero point, much like we did for our uh, dissociation of the salts into ions. And we actually choose the same substance. So what we do is we set the reduction potential for this particular, what we call a half reaction, to zero. So we define the voltage associated electrical potential with the dissociation of hydrogen gas into an electron and H plus as zero. Um, and then we base everything else off of it. So what we can do is then hook up a zinc electrode to a hydrogen electrode um, and measure the voltage difference. If we measure this, we find an electrical potential of uh, a 0 0.76, um, which means that the difference between zinc and hydrogen in their affinity for electrons is 0 0.76 volts. And we can also measure the direction of flow and figure out that the electrons are flowing from the zinc to the hydrogen. Um, since we know that the electrons uh, prefer higher electrical potentials, that means the hydrogen electrical potential is greater than zinc. And so the electrical uh, potential of zinc can be set to negative 0 0.76. We can then hook it up to a copper, measure a voltage of 1.1, and no copper must be 1.1 volts higher than zinc. If zinc is at negative 0 0.76, then we can do the math and copper must be at 0 0.34. For. And we can continue this on and measure the half cell potential for any species that we want to do. You can see here when we have these two uh, cells hooked together that we have a salt bridge. We actually need the salt bridge to allow the flow of ions. Um, so the salt bridge is something that some medium that doesn't allow the the metal ions to go through, but allows the charge to go through. Um, and in lab, we've done this with some, simply soaking a filter paper in sodium chloride. Uh, and it could be any sort of ionic species in here. What this does is essentially complete the circuit. So without the salt bridge, if you hook these two things together, the electrons would flow from the zinc into the hydrogen, but then the hydrogen solution would have an excess of negative charge and the zinc solution would have an excess of positive charge, and that would stop the reaction from continuing. So connecting them together with this salt bridge completes the circuit and allows the charge to equilibrate through the salt bridge and actually allows for a net flow of electrons from one side to the other. We can measure this with a, an applied voltage. So if we had a, a different kind of instrument over here that doesn't just read the voltage, but actually applies another voltage, we can figure out that applying a voltage of 1.1 volts would stop this reaction. What we can do from there is maybe increase the voltage supplying to 1.11. That would then allow electrons to flow from um, the copper to the zinc. If we went to 1.09, they would flow from zinc to the copper. And what we have is a very small change in voltage leading to a reversible uh, reaction. We can go from one way to the other. And that suggests we already defined that the, uh, the voltage here, the work associated with this is actually reversible work. Since if we change the voltage in a very slight amount, we get a difference in direction uh, of the driving variable. Consider the copper zinc cell that we looked at on the last slide. This is also called the Daniel cell after its inventor. If we look up the reduction potentials for copper and zinc, we'll find the following values. Reduction potentials are always written in this way with the metals being reduced. So we have the reaction between zinc ions and two electrons to form zinc metal with a reduction potential of negative 0.76. And we have the same reaction for copper ions with a reduction potential of 0 0.34. We can decide the way that the electrons are flowing because the electrons will flow 
from whatever has the lowest reduction potential to whatever has the highest reduction potential. So in this case, the electrons are going to flow from zinc into copper. We can put these two things together to figure out the overall reaction. So we can define the overall reaction as electrons flowing from the lower metal electrical potential. So in this case, zinc to the higher reduction potential metal, copper, and then that would make uh, zinc ions and copper metal. Note that in the overall balanced reaction, there are no electrons. The electrons are not included in this overall process because every electron produced by zinc is consumed by copper. We can put the voltages together to figure out the overall potential for this reaction. And that is simply by taking the higher one and then subtracting the lower one. So in this case, the overall cell potential would be equal to 0 0.34 minus negative 0 0.76 for a voltage of 1.10. And this would be our voltage for this process. Now, this is assuming that we are under standard conditions and the thing that will get us, so standard temperature, standard pressure, and most commonly that's gonna change is the concentrations of zinc and copper. If the concentrations of zinc and copper ion are not one molar, um, or more specifically, the, the activities are not one molar, um, then this will not give us a voltage of 1.10 and we'll see how to describe that in the next uh, minutes here. So how can we describe the voltage? And this is also often called the EMF or the electromotive force of this reaction. We'll start by considering the free energy. So for this process, we can calculate a change of free energy for the reaction. And that's simply going to be equal to the chemical potentials of the products minus the chemical potentials of the reactants. So we have, and, and we have to consider the electrochemical potential. So we have the electrical chemical potential of zinc metal plus, or zinc ions, plus the electrochemical potential of copper metal minus the electrochemical potential of the zinc metal minus the electrochemical potential of the copper metal. In this case, the electrochemical potentials of the pure metals are zero because they're not really affected by the electrical potential. So we can take these guys out. Um, and what do we say about the electrochemical potentials of the ionic species? Well, the electrochemical potentials of the ionic species are equal to the standard uh, electrical potentials plus RT natural log of their activity. Um, and so doing that will give us the difference in the standard potentials and then plus RT natural log of the activity of the products, which is zinc in this case, over the activity of the reactants. And here we can uh, recognize a couple of things. First, this standard state here um, is we can represent that as the standard Gibbs free energy, just like we've done before. And then the ratio of activities here is simply equal to the reactant quotient, which will eventually become the equilibrium constant, since it's the concentration of the products divided by the concentration of reactants. We can also recognize that the Gibbs free energy of this process is related to the electrical work done since electrical work is a non-expansion work. And so in this case, the change of Gibbs free energy is also equal to negative N, where N is the number of moles of electrons transferred times Faraday's constant times the change in potential between them. And what we'll do is instead of having that delta phi, we'll use the symbol um, E to describe that. So then we can go ahead and evaluate this. So we have an expression that says the uh, delta G for the reaction is equal to the standard delta G plus RT natural log of the activity of zinc over the activity of copper. If we use standard conditions, the activity of zinc and the activity of copper are equal to each other and they're equal to one. So we can uh, take those out of the equation. So under standard conditions, our delta G is going to be equal to negative NFE, which is negative 2FE, since two electrons are being transferred in this process. Um, since these guys are one under standard conditions, that natural log becomes zero. And we have this relationship that delta G naught is equal to negative 2FE. And if this is standard conditions, we say that E is equal to E naught. 
So this gives us a relationship between delta G naught of a reaction and delta and E of a reaction. So in general, the electrochemical potential for a reaction is equal to the Gibbs free energy by the following. The Gibbs free energy is equal to negative number of moles of electrons times Faraday's constant times the electromotive force, the voltage for that process. If we plug both of these things back into the equation, uh, our equation being delta G for the reaction is equal to delta G not for the reaction plus RT natural log of Q, we end up with NFE is equal to NFE not minus RT natural log of Q. We can divide by NF and end up with the equation that the uh, EMF is equal to the standard EMF minus RT over NF natural log of Q. So if we're at uh, some concentrations of different ions, that is not a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship, that's not one molar each, we can calculate what the actual electromotive force um, would be. This equation is known as the Nernst equation and it allows us to calculate the voltage that we measure, the EMF, under non-standard conditions. Looking at this equation here, we can see that relatively small voltages will lead to very large free energies uh, because the Faraday's constant is so large. So for our Daniel cell, the number of electrons transferred is two. Faraday's constant is 96,500 coulombs per mole. And the electrochemical potential difference is 1.10 volts. So multiplying these together, it gives us a very large number. We get negative 212 kilojoules per mole uh, as the delta G naught for this process. Now, this we, we can relate this to an equilibrium constant and realize that almost all of the reactants here will be converted to products. So the voltage actually provides a very convenient way to measure the free energy for this because you couldn't really measure the concentration of reactants at the end of the reaction. Uh, and we'll see how we do this in more detail in the next lecture. I'll leave you before uh, we go with one last equation. Um, what we can do is also use this to determine the entropy. So we know that the entropy change for a process is equal to the negative partial derivative of the Gibbs free energy change for that process over the temperature. And here we know how the Gibbs free energy is related to the uh, uh, EMF. So it's equal to negative NFE. Uh, N and F are constants, so we can pull those out. And the entropy change is simply equal to NF times the derivative of E with respect to temperature. So this is what we are doing in lab four. We are measuring how the cell EMF changes as a function of temperature and using that to go and figure out what the entropy for these processes are. Uh, and then with that, we know delta G, we know delta S, so we could calculate delta H uh, from them, of course, because delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Uh, so we could calculate delta H from knowing those two things. So we'll resume in the next lecture by looking at the equilibrium constant and how we can calculate that. It's pretty straightforward from where we already have. And then we'll go on and describe electrochemical cells and batteries in some more detail.